What's up, you amazing listeners and viewers tuning in from whichever platform you get your podcast from. I'm your host, Chronic, from the Cannabis Chronicles on Instagram and YouTube, and I'm back with another episode of the Homegrown Podcast you all know and love. Be sure to hit that like button and show some major love for Homegrown Cannabis Co., as they are the reason this podcast ha- happens. So, Without further ado, I have another fun interview episode with you guys and gals today. In today's episode, we're bringing on a brand new face over at Homegrown Cannabis Co. that's helping us with garden issues, including pest and IPM, out over in the greenhouse with Parker Curtis. Today's guest is Matthew Gates. He's going to be a absolutely educational beast on IPM and pest management. So pest management. So definitely hit that like button and show them some major love down in the comments. Thank you, Matthew, for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a lot of questions because I am not a bug guru myself. And man, I've uh, I've definitely got some curiosity over here as well as some IPM uh, questions to get at you. But before we do that, I always have all my guests answer a fun question to get, get started. Uh, so what are the three strains that you've preferred to smoke lately? Or if you don't smoke, if you consume cannabis, or maybe you don't consume cannabis, what are three strains you find the prettiest? So any of those, take it away. <laughs> My friend Brandon Russ, uh, Death Breath, Ooh. immediately, no, no, uh, you know, no need to uh, think about this very much. That was a, a very nice strain that I had um, a while ago, but it's still in my head. Um, I had some, uh, uh, some Sour Diesel, obviously very mm-hmm. classic, very classic strain that was very good recently. And um, although also it wasn't very recent, uh, another strain that I don't think is available at all ever anymore uh, was this strain that a buddy of mine grew here in the San Diego area called Orange Tang. And it had a very strong orange citric sort of flavor and aroma to it. And um, I don't think that plant exists anymore. So those are three strains that are at least at the top of my mind, even if I won't be able to have them in the future. <laughs> well, maybe someone listening has their hands on some orange tang and can help you out. Man, those sound sour diesel is always one of my favorites. I'm a sucker for sour diesel growing up in Florida that came through a lot. But those other ones, I don't know the first one, death breath. That I have no idea what terpenes uh, that could be. But orange tang I mean, anything citrus, anything orangey, I always love those like fresh flavors and they kind of give you those like more clear and uh, smooth uh, head highs. I I just love them. But what is this death breath? I'm curious now. (laughs) Yeah. So my buddy, uh, my buddy, Brandon, um, Russ Brandon on Instagram and uh, various other social media, he, um, he developed it. I don't actually know the lineage off the top of my head, but it's got, it's a very sort of pungent, gassy Mm -hmm sort of um some people might he might he sometimes says it's sort of meaty or earthy Um, i really think that depends on the person um but to me it's just it's very very much has an aroma and a a flavor profile that kind of sits in your in your mouth in your lungs that has Mm. um and it's very sort of like it's just sort of a strong um i think mostly gas i would say you know to give sort of a general profile to it it's just very gassy and and i tend to like that a lot I love those gassy strains. I'm a big fan of them. Not everyone likes them. You know, my fiance is not really big on them. She likes the lemon and, you know, the sweeter terps. But I'm I'm a sucker for some gas and some heavy diesel strains or those chemically like flavors. I don't know. I I like them. They hit hard. They pack a punch. So I love what I love your terpenes of choice. And uh, I want to break you into the next fun question here. Now, all my guests are stoners at heart generally, and they brought, they got into cannabis usually at a younger age. So how did you find yourself smoking the devil's lettuce? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had several um, opportunities with, um, you know, my best friend who I've known since elementary school. And there have been several times where he had offered uh, to me and I just I rejected it um, at the time several for several reasons. Um, I actually I had possibly a different career path um, earlier in my life uh, where I didn't really want to have that become a, a, an issue. Um, yeah. But so that was part of it. But um, originally it was in a sh- social setting at a party like many other people. And um, that career uh, trajectory didn't pan out or didn't go mm-hmm. the way that I wanted it to. So uh, that wasn't really a problem anymore. 
and um, I have to say it was it was a uh, it was not a super spectacular or like amazing thing. I think it's actually pretty normal for a lot of people. Um, and uh, actually, my first time was with a homemade um, gravity bomb. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was very, you know, there was no uh, inhalation problems. None of that. Like, oh, you got to inhale, you know. Um, uh, but yeah. And my, and my favorite way to consume nowadays is through um, a joint or through an atomizer. It depends on mm-hmm. what I'm doing and what's, uh, what's easiest. That's awesome. No, I love that, man. And it really is like a lot of the times, like at a party, just hanging out, hitting a jeep or, you know, and, and for those who listening, a jeep is just what we call a gravity bong. It's the initials GB. So it's just what they say, jeep. Um, but that is so funny because growing up in Florida, that's literally like all kids do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're like 15, 16, you go to your friend's house and they're like, yo, take a hit of the jeep. And it's like a two liter or something. And you're like, oh, dear God, like here comes my lungs, you know, like <laughs> it's always the funny, uh, funny part of hitting those, but that's really quite, uh, uh, yeah, that's always fun. That's that's a nice little story. It's not something crazy where you're like, yeah, so listen, I had this uncle. I sold like two pounds to, you know what I mean? You're not like out here yeah. doing some crazy stuff. No, that's awesome. So what was this other uh, uh, venture or career path that, you know, didn't work out? I mean, n- not to bring any, if, if, if it was a sadden type deal that it didn't work out, but it looks like it might've worked out in the end for you as a, I mean, you're, you're on a pretty cool journey now, right? Oh, Yeah. There's no problem with it. Um, I wanted to, I was, I was on a trajectory. I come from a military family, so oh. I wanted to originally go to the U S army. So okay. obviously they'd have a problem with that. <laughs> um, although they have a terror, although even when I was trying to get in, I wanted to commission my branch of choice to have been military intelligence. Um, but who knows what that would have gone and been like. Um, but there were many reasons why I didn't go along with it. Um, you know, even at the time, even at that time, they were having a terrible issue with recruiting people. Mm. Um, very difficult. Still having a problem with that now. So I feel like if they were to loosen up, maybe a little bit on the uh, on what's a restriction and what's not, which they have in the past, you know, maybe mm. they'd get a few more people and they'd be a little bit more tolerant, maybe. But regardless of all that, um, I didn't go that drought. Um, you know, I had a, a talk with many people. Yeah. who were in people who were not cadre that kind of a thing and ultimately i thought that i could serve the world better with my first love which is you know plants insects and their interactions in ecology and i honestly you couldn't have said that if the sentence like finalize that sentence any better it just segues to the next question perfectly and uh that is literally when did your passion kind of ignite like was it at that moment where you're like okay i think uh you know it's not looking like the military for me like i, I do want to consume cannabis i don't want to be you know living uh you know all maybe i'm, I'm sure I tattoo military veterans um, here and there, and I hear all the spiel, spiels of what the military brings. I'm in very much support of our military, but I also know what vets complain about. So I'm sure all that you heard, and then you were like, mm-hmm. yo, I think I'd rather smoke weed. So <laughs> where did the passion for the actual bug aspect of it and the IPM aspect come from? Like, uh, did you start? cultivating and was there some like issue you had early on did you always like insects like where did that come from i always found them very interesting even at a young age um you know they're all over the place so there's something that's very easy to see and find um i think that what drew me to them is that they just have this sort of alien like look to them right they're not mammals they don't have skin like we do they you know so there's i think there's a lot of fat yeah, there's a lot of fascination there that various people, um, some people have and some people hate. Um, so I, I enjoyed that um, growing up. And uh, I was a Boy Scout growing up, too. And I would go on a lot of okay. hikes and I would travel, you know, I would go up Mount Whitney and, and Half Dome in Yosemite as a, as a teenager, young teen. Um, That's really cool. But to, I had a lot of really good outdoors experiences. And so always kind of interested in sort of the naturalistic you know world like john muir kind of thing um so i just found that fascinating and so i always had that passion um in my teenage years 
and my young adult years, I worked with people who grew plants, not just mm. cannabis, but also cannabis. And there mm. was a massive lack for people who, you know, knew what was going on. So all of that kind of coalesced and became um, a jumping off point to offer those services uh, in a professional capacity moving forward. Well, that's awesome, man. I love it. And I love that it's like actually just stems from a really wholeheartedly passion you had as a kid for an interest of nature. Like, um, you know, same, I wasn't always into insects. I've definitely grown to appreciate them because, um, growing up, I kind of liked all the, the furry things a little bit more. And I did like my lizards and reptiles, but insects kind of freaked me out mainly because I got bit by a lot of spiders growing up. Right. So I was always mm-hmm. freaked out. Um, and then when I learned to appreciate them was when I actually, uh, I, I started building bioactive enclosures for my reptiles and stuff. So we had to work with, you know, the armadillidians or I had to, you know, maybe breed some cockroaches for my bearded dragon. So I started gaining this appreciation for them. But when I really gained the appreciation was when I got into garden and I realized like how much this little like life cycles encapsulated by like these predatory mites that are like you know gonna kill the the bad mites that you don't want and like you know like all this stuff that goes into it and like I realized I didn't know anything about it and so I found myself watching like hours of videos of gentlemen like yourselves talking (laughs) and telling people what bugs were so that leads me to my next question when you were first helping your friends and uh you know learning i'm sure it was like a big learning curve because uh nothing comes like fast and there's always going to be some curves um what were some of like the most interesting insects that you learned about early on that really you didn't expect to see in a garden Hmm. um well actually maybe not in the beginning but uh Mm -hmm. recently i think a big one was been uh termites whoa Um, termites yeah i know there's uh most of the time termites feed on deadwood most yeah. people are familiar with them eating your house or mm-hmm. something. But there are what are called Formosan termites that um, they'll feed on living wood too. So that's a huge problem. Very difficult to deal with. Um, they come from Southeast Asia, Taiwan kind of area. It's where they get their name. And so um, anywhere where they've established is pretty much been impossible to eradicate them. And I have seen them go after cannabis plants, for example, but um, early on, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the pests that affect cannabis have often been pests that affect other plants too. So yeah. really, it was pretty easy to sort of extrapolate a lot of the same treatments, um, a lot of the same techniques, that kind of a thing uh, you could utilize. There are some that are specific, though. And perhaps the one of the ones that I was not aware of necessarily in the beginning, very beginning, helping out my friends was. Um, uh, the hemp russet mite, right? Because it's a specialist oh, yes. of cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. So people know tomato russet mite, citrus mm-hmm. russet mite. Um, but uh, yeah, the hemp russet mite is a big problem. And also perhaps the budworms, uh, still a massive problem now, but also another thing that people often um, beat their head against. Like those little cat, they're like the little, almost like tiny hornworm looking things, right? Yeah, and they'll like dive into the the bud and um, mess it all up. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Well, that's quite interesting. I, you know, I wouldn't ever consider a termite for hemp. You know, like that's like the one thing that I don't go to with that is like, you know, you do think like, oh, dead wood termite, my, my living plants are safe. So did you, is this something like people brought over with their luggage? Is it something that just came over like maybe on a bird type thing or like, what was this? How did this issue of termite termites kind of start happening if they're East Asia lo- locality kind of thing? How, do you, do you guys know, is that something you guys study? Is that, is that uh, being researched or anything? It is, and um, my understanding is that uh, it mostly comes from either from lumber or from just people mm. carrying or, or so like bringing in um, structures and things like that, and and that's one way that they can get through. I do think that uh, I don't think that we know exactly how they first got in, but there's a pretty good consensus about when and and where. Um, and a lot of places have been. Um, in the west coast of the USA, but there are other places that they've been to as well. And um, yeah, they're very difficult. They're extremely difficult to get rid of wherever they've established. And I don't, um, I don't think that bodes very well for the cannabis growers out there. 
Yeah, that's like very kind of uh, worrisome if you think about it, because if you do get like a breakout, like, I mean, I'm guessing it's pretty much essentially like kill it with fire, call your crop and burn it all to the ground kind of thing. And you've really got to rid it with some like insecticide or something like that. What goes into killing um, a colony of termites that are pretty much unkillable? <laughs> yeah, not much because of the exact you know circumstance of it. Because the issue is that they can feed on living and I'm pretty sure also uh, dead wood as well. So it's like both of those are going to be abundant. You'd have to kill the nest probably. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's no guarantee that you won't get a nest next season or in a mm. few months or something like that. Right. So that's kind of the truth for ants, you know, which can sometimes be a problem directly for plants or an indirect problem with um, other insects that they might help out. But mm. yeah, sometimes you run into a problem where, you know, and as a integrated pest management specialist, you never want to hear somebody tell you that like the final solution is the only solution that you can do, right? You want to have other options available, but yeah, that's not always possible. You know, it's so funny that you say that because the last uh, gentleman I talked to, Taylor Robinson, we were talking about viruses and it's kind of like the same thing with what you're saying. It's like, he's like, you know, there are some viruses where it's like, once you have it, really, the only option is, you know, you got to call it, you, you got to kill it, you know, get it out of there, you know, do the whole process. And that's, it sounds like if someone gets these termites, it's, it's, it's kind of like the whole, okay, now we're at war for the property. <laughs> so like, yeah. let's try to win this war. Um, are there any insects naturally that fight them? Um, Cause I'm, I'm going to lead up to my next question, but I definitely, you've piqued my curiosity with these termites, but I don't want to make the whole show about termites but are there any insects that eat these termites or um are the termites do they like reproduce too rapidly for that to even matter yeah the main issue is that um uh the there i don't think there's really uh, like an insect biocontrol there are some mm. fungi that you might be able to use i'm a big mm. proponent of um, a fungus called buveria bassiana which you might be able to apply to the uh, either the nest um, or maybe to the substrate that they're eating and then they kind of carry this fungal parasite that parasitizes insects back to the nest maybe and then they, then they might be able to be killed but mm. um, yeah not really insect biocontrols are available and um, again like the real issue is that the nest is where the queen is laying all the eggs and mm -hmm. making more um, adults now Fun fact is that termites are actually closely related to cockroaches. Oh. Actually, all termites descend from a lineage of cockroaches and uh, oh. that ate wood. And they got really good at that. And um, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, they're, you know, cockroaches are well known for uh, being mm -hmm. hard to kill. So I just feel like it's par for the course. You know, it's so funny. And it's like so many people don't really think about uh, cockroaches just being big old isopods. I mean, that's essentially what they are. They just go around eating dead matter and everything like that. And they've just got their shells on and they're just, you know, walk around. They're creepy as shit and they can hiss and they can, you know, they can fly. Uh, but yes, they are remote, remarkably, remarkably hard to kill. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure at my old job years and years, years back, I, I was working at a dog boarding place we had these chemical sanitization buckets that we would put like the dog poop scoops in and there was literally a cockroach that had fallen in there i guess early in the day but like i like poured it in the sink and this, the thing was still alive and i was just you know any other bug would have been like dead burnt up and crisp but of, of course a freaking cockroach is alive so that's interesting that termites uh come from them you have you've, you've already taught me quite a bit today i'm learning so much so <laughs> That's, uh, I don't, I, I like when they zoom in, do they kind of have like the same face and shit as a cockroach? Cause that, that's not, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like they're very, they're very different than their sort of wood cockroach um, okay. ancestor really. Um, and, and, but yeah, so they're, uh, they what allow them to be very effective is that they have this, um, these bacteria in their gut that breaks down uh -huh. the. The, the xylem or not the xylem but the um the, but the wood the the xylos mm. that, mm. that that like the really hard cellulose you know that creates yeah. wood as we think of it 
And so um, if they didn't have that, they wouldn't be able to do any of that at all. So maybe there's some opportunities for that. Maybe we could apply something that kills those bacteria and then they get indigestion and die. Ah. And there, are some, there are some unique options out there maybe for the entrepreneuring microbiologist or something listen smart people that are smarter than me and potentially smarter than matthew even though he's really smart but those people that are like yo elon smart go make something that he just said i just got to try, I try. No, seriously. Uh, no, we can use it honestly we can, we can use the help and the funding, but yeah. <laughs> um, so that leads me into my next question. And this is going to get away from the uh, uh, termites. We're going to get into k- kind of general uh, pest management and stuff like that. I think the number one question, and I'm sure you hear this more than anything when you're helping people, because organic gardening is becoming such a big popular um, you know, go-to kind of thing, You know, getting away from PGRs, pesticides, insecticides. What is your best advice for growers nowadays? And you can take us maybe state by state or the area that you work with, um, or maybe just your general advice that you see a lot. Um, But what are some of the advice you give to growers when they have like these crazy pest outbreaks or something, or maybe not an outbreak, but just enough to where it's like, okay, I need to manage this. What kind of non-harsh methods are you telling these organic farmers um you know are you telling them to use any specific products are you telling them to use any specific bugs or you know what are, what is your go to on that it really is context dependent not only where you're growing and how you're growing like are you indoor outdoor mm-hmm. greenhouse but also like what the exact pest is um the same thing won't work for different ones necessarily so the best sort of techniques are sort of you know, like the best ones are more broad spectrum without like harming the environment. Right. Ah, so like okay. the Bouveria I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. colonizes all kinds of insects, but um, you've got to be responsible with how you apply it, even if it's like organic, you know, um, mm. because a big part of being sort of holistic is knowing all of the factors or as many as you can. And then sort of using that information to parse, well, I can do this for this and I can use this for this. And then the I in integrated pest management is how you integrate all of those things together. And so if you're, for example, um, you got spider mites, for example, but you've also mm. got like budworms or something else. Oh. If you've got multiple pests, you've got to, you know, you got to figure out which one's more critical, which is the more critical problem. Like spider mites are probably not going to kill your plants. Almost never. Yeah. Those budworms are going to jack it up. (laughs) They're going to jack up your your yield. Yeah, exactly. Um, So you've got to sort of understand like which ones are going to be the worst for your, for your grow, uh, for your output, for your yield, that kind of a thing. Um, Okay. Some things you can do are like physical barriers um, mm. you know, as, as, as much as I don't like to say it, like some locations, the pest pressure is going to be so massive and maybe it's not massive that year, but maybe but it's going to be two years or four years or 10 years later, things change. <laughs> right. And farmers are often, you know, blindsided because maybe the weather patterns were different or, you know, the climate in your area mm-hmm. changes every, maybe every 10 years you get like a monsoon or or like a really epic dry period or, or something like that. So they even grow new crops plan, every 10 years, you know, Eric Brandstad was talking about that, not to cut you off, but you were so on par. Eric Brandstad was talking about how every, every five to 10 years when his parents were growing in Mendocino, um, you would see different crops because it would just change because the, the crops would suck nutrients out. So I'm sure that affects which in- insects are showing up, you know, which, which food choices are there and everything continue. Oh, yeah. Sorry for, for interrupting. Oh, no problem. Uh, That's actually a really good point because, um, you know, what crops people are growing around you is a massive effect as well. If you're in, if you're in the ag space, if you're in a place where there's a lot of other agricultural activity, then, you know, their pests are your pests probably. Mm. And so if you're growing outdoor with no shelter, no greenhouse, no, nothing, nothing like that, you got to protect your plants usually. Like if the budworm moths come in and decide that they're going to lay some of their a thousand plus eggs potentially in your crop then like if you have no netting if you have no structure like what's going to happen is you're going to probably have a a massive yield loss if you and also seasonally you can do things like trapping like with the moths you put out a pheromone it attracts Mm. the male moths uh the male moths come in they get stuck in a trap and then you can you can tell 
based on when you put out the trap. And usually you want to put it out at a time before when those moths are active in your location, which could be different in different places. But then you can know, oh, I'm getting the budworm moths now. I haven't seen anything in my crop yet, but this is when I should apply preventatively some things like maybe Bacillus thuringiensis or BT or something mm. like that. Okay. And do you recommend like when people are spraying for these bud moss or just you said net. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking like some straight up like Cheech and Chong where they have like the blue tarps and, you know, they got nets over the plants, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like, is that what you're talking about? Like a, the black mesh netting around your plant to make sure that like a bug can't fly into it? Yeah, there's um, there's specific insect netting that you can get. Um, there's also a screen like what's called thrips screen because it's meant mm -hmm. for the really slender, really thin thrips so they can't get through. But of okay. course, it will also work for bigger things like moths and that kind of a thing. And they're chunky. These moths are rather large. Um, so as long as you're not, if, as long as you separate the plants so that the adults can lay their eggs, then you don't have a problem at all. You've, you've totally, um, you know, abated it because they're only a problem with the larvae get there and they're not going to like travel from outside into your plants typically. So, you know, it's kind of like you'll either have a big problem or no problem sometimes depending on what avenue of approach you take. Okay. All right. So it really does sound like what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a little scenario at you because we have so many farmers out there, so many different locations. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with like maybe two or three examples. And I want you to tell me what you would recommend them to do because I, I get asked about 10,000 times I easy a week about people's pest problems. And I don't know. I know enough about pests in the sense of, you know, what's online. I grow indoors in a tent and I literally never go in my tent if I went outside. So I don't have pests to deal with, not to say like I'm going to knock on wood there, but I keep my garden really clean. So I've never had firsthand experience with pests. Now, let's say you're a gardener, uh, you're outdoor, not in a greenhouse. You have four plants roughly in a 10 square foot. Uh, maybe a, a 20 square foot marker. They're not massive, but they're like, you know, maybe 40 gallon grow pots. And they have, um, let me pick it. They've got spider mites, aphids, and some thrips that show up. What are you mm -hmm. going to tell them to do? What kind of aphid? Uh, root aphid? or Root, not aphid. root aphid. Yeah, root, root aphid. aphid. Well, let's make it really difficult then. All right. Yeah. So spider mice, root <laughs> aphids, and thrips. That's a pretty common smorgasbord of, uh, of pests. So, um, you know, without knowing how many and all that stuff, that, that mm -hmm. all plays a role. But, but generally speaking, um, so the spider mice and the thrips. So none of these pests are like what I would like to call like a, um, you know, like a high threat to the life of the plant. Like they're not going to outright kill the plant usually, cool. even all three of them at once. They're going to okay. beleaguer it. They're going to yeah. like make it hate its life, but it's probably <laughs> not going to kill the plant. It'll, it'll perhaps kill your yield, but not yes. the plant. Whereas other, other insects and other pests, um, you know, could just outright kill the plant, you know? So, so there's that, that silver lining there. Um, the root aphids, I would say are probably the highest threat as like a, as like a mm. difficulty to deal with okay. because part of the population in some cases, um, you know, maybe you have all of it in the root zone and none of them have gone onto the foliage. Mm. Sometimes you have it where, um, you know, they build up a population in the ground and then they kind of go up into the foliage and you get some winged aphids. So mm. if you're in that circumstance, then you kind of have two fronts that you have to battle, whereas okay. before you only had one. Um, so like you can apply and are you in flower? No, that's another question. Oh, we're going to do this one not in flower. This is going to be sure. middle of veg. Okay, yeah. So you have more options there. Um, for rice root aphid, I like to use um, like a, some sort of a botanical insecticide. Mm -hmm. That's uh, It's harsh for the insects, but it's not harsh for the plant. It's not going to be systemic and get in your plant and then get into your bud okay. and then you smoke it. Very against let's, this. let's take a pause real quick uh, and explain systemic and explain why that's important to understand when you're using products because a lot of people don't know that when they buy products and I have to explain that a lot to people. Absolutely. So there's there's three 
like kinds of, of compounds in that classification. There's um, what I guess regular or something that's not translaminar and not systemic. That's just a contact kill that just stays on the, the top of the plant, the epidermis of the plant, right? Um, then you have something that's translaminar, which means that the chemical goes into the tissue. It goes from the outside and bleeds into the tissue essentially and stays there usually. Um, so like wherever you hit it is where it sort of stays. So if you hit, if you just spray like the top of the plant it stays in the top tissues, mm. but it's inside the tissues and it stays there. It doesn't uh, sort of move around the plant systemic usually not always, but usually is the whole thing. You, you can apply it in the roots. It gets into the, the stem. It gets into the top of the plant. It cycles through the plant. Um, or in some cases you apply it to part of the plant and then just goes up from that mm -hmm. section up, depending on what pathways it takes and that kind of a thing. So systemics are, are a problem because they get into your flower and then you, you don't want to smoke that. So, yeah. And that's so breaking back to what we were saying prior, you pretty much want to make sure that you're uh, uh, going to spray something that is a non systemic because you don't want it stuck in your flower. Since we are in veg, you want it to be the least invasive to the plant, but the harshest you can to the insect or um, to whatever you're fighting. Is that kind of like the correct outlook that you're having? Exactly, exactly. And, and it's hard for people to understand that information. A lot of people don't know um, these technical um, classifications. Um, they don't. A lot. I've met a lot of people who are like, "Yeah, man, I don't get any pests. I use malathion, and I'm like, that's terrible. Excuse me. That's 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 very bad. Like, you should go to a doctor. Do not use malathion. No, don't use carbamates. Don't use." You know, uh, you know, microbutanol, you know, don't use any of these things. And these are the same so, people that are like, yo, I take a dab and throw up instantly after. That's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was good. It was strong. It was effective. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so it's, it's unfortunate. Um, I, my friend that I mentioned earlier in this podcast, um, he had an uncle who actually recently passed away and that's actually where that story comes from. He, he was my friend was introducing me to him. I don't know if it was a malathion. It was probably a lot of things. Um, was, to be honest, I respect the guy, but he was he had kind of an unhealthy lifestyle. Um, but yeah, like he that's how I was introduced to him. My friend's like, my friend this is my friend Matt. He works in pests and plants and you grow cannabis and you know, you said you had some problems. He's like, No, I don't have any problems. I use this stuff called malathion. And I'm like, you know what like <laughs> that's terrible you you have a lot of problems sir <laughs> actually yeah you have one big problem um so so yeah so so that's just a little anecdote right don't don't do that so you would apply something like um like i use pyrethrin for example not mm. permethrin yes. which is a different compound <laughs> and people get those mixed up all the time especially when i'm on a podcast like this and somebody says permethrin yeah no pyrethrin Pyrethrin Pi is different. It decays. Um, what I mean to say when I, that's a technical term with chemicals, it means it breaks apart. Mm. So it decays readily. Um, so it, it, uh, it does not stay itself for a long time. And it then, um, uh, and then like, it's also photoreactive. So the light that hits it will make that happen quicker. So oh, on cool. the one hand, that's not beneficial if you're applying in some cases, you might lose a little bit of efficacy. But it's a contact kill. So hmm. you really want to just, you know, as long as you got coverage, it should be okay. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why I like to use it. It's, it's a botanical product. It comes from chrysanthemum and, oh. um, you know, and it's, you can synthesize it. You can make it as well. I but, love chrysanthemums. Um, They're so pretty. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, and so, you know, sort of like neem, right? Where like there's, there's historical usage of chrysanthemums as like a, um, I'm not sure if it's an anti-helmic or thelmic or whatever. I know like what you're talking anti, about. But like an anti-parasitic kind of thing. Mm -hmm. or, or they use it for other, other problems or they have in the past. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's because of the same properties, essentially. Uh, similarly, like with neem, you know, for mil millennia, different cultures, uh, particularly in S uh, South Asia, have used the plant and various 
products from the plant for antimicrobial or anti-insecticidal um, properties. So there's a lot of benefits there. So I would like to, I would use like a pyrethrin product and then I would, what's called drench it. Okay. Which means you would apply it into the um, substrate. So like if you're mm. in soil, you know, you'd apply it into the soil. You'd also apply it to the foliage too. And it would also greatly harass the spider mites and also the thrips. So you can kind okay. of use one product for all three in this particular case. Even though spider mites are not insects and they have a different physiology, it does, um, you know, it's not great for their health. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. And they're more closer so, to like arachnids, aren't they? They are arachnids, yeah, mice. Okay. So, so okay. they um, they split off a long time ago. Um, and and spider mites, I love to talk about them because they are, um, they are incredibly good at resisting plant defenses. But we don't have to get into that. To answer your question, though, I would use maybe I would start with a pyrethrin and buvaria combination. Okay. So the pyrethrin negatively affects the root aphids in the ground and also the others in the foliage. And then the buvaria comes in and while they're basically, you know, paralyzed and dying, okay. um, some of them might not have been as hurt as others potentially, but then the buvaria comes in and it's more effective because they are in a sort of a weakened state or a moribund dying state. We've poisoned them. <laughs> yes, they're, they're dying, they're poisoned. Oh. Pyrethrin works on insects because um, j- there's a few effects it can have, but generally it's like a muscle, it's like, um, you know, it's like a muscle toxin. And so like, mm. it, or it's neurotoxic, I should say, but like basically it causes them to not be able to um move essentially oh, so they're paralyzed wow. and so they can't okay. feed and so they die a slow death um but you should always be careful of resistance spider mites and thrips there are populations out there who are resistant to things as nasty and and terrible as like uh like ddt or things yeah. in that class yeah I um, see I've heard of stories like that where people are spraying like full outbreaks and it's like it literally looks like spiders have infested this place because it's webs everywhere it's like nuts yeah and so that's the thing we should always be cautious to consider is that like even if you have this like crackerjack um plan you know you should always check to see that it worked sometimes the problem is not the usually if you have a problem and the product has worked before you know other people for which it's worked you might have a coverage problem. Maybe you didn't apply mm. enough over the foliage. You didn't get under the leaves and into the leaves. You didn't penetrate through the canopy. So little things like that are kind of hard to teach or talk about, but it's like the art of the of the um, spray rather than the science, if that makes sense. And I'm guessing that also comes into play when people is like not even coverage, but like concentration. Like, did you put enough of the, you know, what's needed into the dilution? Yeah. Like, did you, oh, yeah. And I'm sure that's probably a part of it. Cause I use the, uh, uh, if I ever get an outbreak like of uh, fungus gnats, you know, that's generally what, I, what I'll see. I, I usually won't see anything else. And that's because I buy soil from my local garden center. And so it sits out in a greenhouse, you know, I generally will get fungus gnats. But usually what I'll do is whenever I know I'm going to use it, I'll use uh, I have Mammoth Farms, their um, insecticide or whatever they have. It's it's the small concentrate bottle, but I like that one a lot. I like Mammoth Farm products um, and I, I'd love to hear your opinion if you know anything about it. Um, but so far it works well. I just generally treat the soil before I even put my seedlings in it and then um once the soil's treated, I'll flush it like about three, four times with like water and just some molasses. And then I, I'm ready to plant my seedling and I don't really notice any, you know, damage and it's not a systematic treatment. So that's nice. Yeah, I don't have a lot of um, to say necessarily. Lots of mammoth products that work well with clients that I work with and that kind of a thing. You know, nothing wrong with that. Um, I feel like... Uh, I think I answered the question from beforehand though. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely did. Yeah. And I was gonna I was gonna throw another scenario at you. I just I wanted yeah, to make sure do. you you got to finish everything that you you would do for it. So the next scenario, which you passed that first one, flying colors, because uh damn, uh that's like ninety nine percent of the problems I, I I deal with is whenever someone sends me their garden, it's always spider mites. Um I can almost bet money it's gonna be spider mites. There's the 1% times people throw me the curveball of some like Asian bug or 
something I've never seen in my life that I have no idea what I'm looking at. And that's where like Google images helps a lot. So this next scenario is going to be Midwest. It's going to be, let's go ahead and do uh, in Oklahoma. This is shout out to Will and uh, Victoria rule. And they're out there uh, working hard, but they're <laughs> in grasshopper hell. So let's talk oh, about sure. grass, <laughs> grasshoppers. And let's talk about, um, Man, what usually goes with grasshoppers a lot? I don't know. What goes with grasshoppers a lot? What do you find uh, with, with your gardeners, with, with grasshoppers in open fields? What's uh, another pest that likes to pair well with the Midwesterners? I don't know. The locusts, the locusts are pretty good at, at uh, extinguishing that competition. You know, just I was about to say, it's mainly just like yeah. dozens of them. So, yeah. So, let's just talk about it. Over When I say overwhelming amount of grasshoppers, like it's like biblical. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so grasshoppers, um, the grasshoppers are super difficult because of what you just said, right? There, there's a mass of them. They swarm. Um, this is another one of the scenarios like budworms where I feel like, you know, the best offense is a, is a really good defense. And if you're caught blindsided, like if you think for whatever reason, I'm not going to get bugs or you're just not considering that possibility, then, you know, you might have a really bad time, but like with the budworms, there are some options. If you're growing outdoor, though, and you have a massive amount of plants, it's a little bit rich for somebody like myself to say, all you need to do is just put in some netting and you're fine. Because it's it's harder than that, right? And I want, I want to make that point very clear to people that, like, they have to have a realistic understanding of their circumstance. Like, if you're growing and you have, like, 10 acres of, like, cannabis and there's... <laughs> you have no structural support or anything like that. And you have only like a few guys, including yourself to like, you know, put everything up. That's going to be really labor intensive and costly. Right. So like you could have ameliorated all of that problem by knowing that there were locusts in the first place. And before mm. you got to the locust season, um, you know, setting up those barriers, for example, but if you're already dealing with them, it can be really challenging to kind of, to, to deal with that. You know what I mean? Sometimes the solution, sometimes it really isn't a really good reactionary solution to certain pests, like the budworms, for example. Because you pretty much you... would have to like cover your whole damn thing with net. Because like you, 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 you keep saying barrier in my mind. I'm like, I'm trying to imagine this thing, but all it keeps going to my head is like this top golf sized barrier <laughs> around your garden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how tall do you need this barrier to be? <laughs> Not very tall. It just has to separate them. I would say that like, I would say that like, um, maybe like you really don't need that much space because they can't okay. like get through it. Right. You know, like okay. even with the budworm moths, I would like, as long as you have a few inches, right. Because they could, they, maybe they could get their, I mean, depending on the, how big the screen size is, maybe you mm. could, maybe they could put their abdomen through, but mm. usually the screen you're getting, I don't think would allow for that. So really it's just a matter of them not getting physically close to the plants. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? So, and I was going to say also that like, so like with budworms, just to give an example, cause those are two, the grasshoppers and the budworms were like, you know, if you're in the middle of it and you didn't have any preparation or treatment, no plan, then like you're really in trouble. Um, but I guess I want to say that like even reactionary and some kinds of cases, prevention treatments like Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, you know, people use that and it's, you know, um, it is uh, <coughs> highly Excuse effective. Me, no problem. It's highly effective. Um, you can also use, uh, there's a, there's a virus out there that's specific to the Helica verpa budworms that you can apply Ooh. as well. It doesn't affect us or anything like that. But even See, I were... love talking about viruses that kill, like, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, you, so your mind, whenever you're digesting, like someone's grow, you really do have to take in literally every variable and you're like, okay, maybe this virus will work better because of the circumstances and stuff. So what would be like, okay, so this is we're we're three weeks into flower. I have no prevention. There's like 200 freaking grasshoppers every day. What is your like, wh am I screwed as a grower if I'm coming to you? For <laughs> you, know, pot you know, potentially you could try to like, and it depends, again, it depends on your resources and logistics. If it's just four dudes and you've got, 
Well, what's your, like one of the questions that I often ask is like, what's your budget? Yeah, I'm a multi-million dollar best. company. Okay, so we okay, have we so have like have a the, team. But you, yes. All right, but then here's this. But here's here's the second question right after that. Okay, you have the money, but are you willing to spend it? See, I I, I run into that a lot too. Where even if they have a lot of the money to do it, I'm a greedy MSO. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Well, I'm yeah, joking. it happens. Um, people, <laughs> no, can so, <laughs> people can be so recalcitrant to, to, oh. to spend the money. It's like you can have either a hundred percent of none of your yield, yeah, or you can I, have, or you can have not that. You know what I mean? And so, like, I'll be. That's the real. That's my real answer to you. Is that like some people have the the, the capacity. Uh, at least they don't want to fork it out (laughs) but they just don't want to do it yeah for whatever reason maybe they think that i'm lying or i'm being lazy Mm -hmm. or some other person that i've talked i've talked to other colleagues where this is also kind of a problem and um i've certainly talked to uh growers who don't write the check but like is like oh man i'm having trouble can you please give me some advice and it's like well the advice is to do this this and this and they're like oh well they don't want to do that or they don't want to spend the money for that or whatever but Uh. yeah to, to to not like you know, I'm not answering your scenario very well, but that is kind of the case. Um, you know, my, my suggestion would be like in a general way to like, you know, you may you mostly just have to, you want to kill the grasshoppers, but you mostly want to limit their ingress. Mm-hmm. And that can be very difficult to do. Like you said, sort of mid, you know, mid season of the grow, um, locusts are kind of everywhere and there's going to be more of them that's kind of what i was trying to say about the budworms earlier which is that like in a similar way even though bt works and the virus works and does kill them one you have to make sure you get enough coverage which is laborious mm-hmm. to do um two you're still buying and using the product so that's labor cost yes. and that's product cost so you're still spending a bunch of money to treat it right mm-hmm. And then on top of all of that, you're still going to have some level of yield loss because it's not yes. going to be perfect. And they're all, yeah. and they're going to keep coming in throughout the months. So they might start in springtime or maybe midsummer, and then they'll be active all the way until October, you know, and when you're harvesting. And so like that's multiple months that you have to be either applying things because you had no plan of action or they just became really outrageous and got out of hand. And so like, a lot of times I feel like the problem is that people didn't have a plan in the first place and now they're just really, really in trouble. And there's not a really good way to like, you know, steer that ship and alter course. No, I, I completely focus. agree. Yeah, I, I, I love listening to what you're saying and it makes a lot of sense. And one thing that anytime I talk to anyone who does IPM, um, they always really, really push prevention 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 like i mean no matter what you're saying is like if it happens and you didn't have any actions or like plans to fix it or plans to do something you're pretty much screwed like you are sol you're on your own and if you're in it it, if you're not willing to spend the money on fixing it it makes no sense to me why reach out to somebody if you're not willing to spend the money to fix it because you're you're gonna end up screwing yourself in the long run so no i mean well, ladies and gentlemen, running farms and <laughs> and and dealing with stuff, you you heard it here. Uh, prevent the shit, okay? If you're dealing with grasshoppers, uh, barriers, you said what? Wait, waist high, like that would that would be just about good for your locust type stuff, or you need to go a little higher for them 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 dudes. Waist high. Waist high. Cool. No, I meant like uh oh, you should it should be covering the plant or it should oh, be covering like, it should be the plant like around okay. the plant like around like the like plant a, like a like a like a cylinder kind of like a okay. cylinder or something or I like get it now. however it works for people but um you know it doesn't have to be like uh Ooh, that's labor intensive to do on a is. whole ass farm that's like a whole, that's yeah. that's no joke that's that's it's real no dedication and that's where it's like. Wow, man, that y- your job is a, a very – you must get a kick out of when people tell you to not uh, – that they don't have the money because you probably go, well, I mean, you're going to be spending – like when, if, when you have a breakout, you're going to be paying X amount of dudes to be walking around your farm drenching every plant to fix it when you could have just put some netting around it. So it probably is like a kick in the ass to yourself where you're like, man, I really wish people would take my advice, but oh well, like, you know, what can I do? I um, often tell people – I often tell people that, um, you know, it's like any kind of security work, biosecurity, physical security, 
you know, nobody wants to spend the money until after they get robbed. And then they're like, oh man, this was a terrible thing. Some people don't, don't, uh, they don't, uh, uh, learn from that situation. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it is kind of a, it is a pretty common problem because I think a lot of people jump in and they think all I got to do is grow really good. And they might even be under the impression that as long as the plant is grown well and has a lot of nutrients and is healthy, then it won't get pests. But that's not really true either. That's a pretty common misconception. Well, and it's it sucks when that misconception. Ugh, my tongue is going crazy today. Between the eyelash that attacked my eye earlier, I don't know if you saw that, that, but uh, <laughs> uh, between the common mis- misconceptions that are portrayed, and then you have like, um, I'll put this nicely: you have pollen chuckers who claim to be good breeders that are saying that their plants are like my plant is mite resistant and will never get this and it's like that's just listen you can make resistant strains but the fact of the matter is is if you get a certain level of pest like they're going to come into your garden like that is if they like your garden they're coming in and you better have some sort of regimen prevention or security um and i think the one thing that i wanted to really which i'm 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 really happy that you've you've kind of beat it into my viewers and listeners here because i really try to tell every single person just do the work for prevention pay the extra money ahead of your grow i don't tell people to spend money on a lot of things cuz like i do think there's a lot of gimmicks with when you get into growing about all yeah. the random shit you need but one thing i always tell people is like you really should have a good ipm whether it's um the can you say that uh, not the bt but the other one the other b word that you keep saying um it's the bavaria bavaria thank you so um the, those types of products are always great to have on hand or even thinking about like if you're going to grow indoors and you don't want fungus gnats okay think about your cover crops think about your various fly traps or things that you want that are natural think about just having those in your garden before the problem becomes becomes a severe issue, which I want to go ahead and ask you, what are the worst outbreaks or what are the insects you're seeing affect uh, growers in 2022 the most, do you think? Like, are there any in particular that are really beating the shit out of outdoor growers right now? Or is it pretty even across the board as far as what the states have access to as far as insects? I actually just wrote a few articles. Um, I wrote one for skunk magazine oh, um, what's up? and uh a few other articles recently about exactly this kind of concept which is that you know in the summertime the budworm ever swarm i would say has yeah. been a huge issue for outdoor growers in particular in various places um you know like these these mods um these budworm mods alika verpa is the genus Usually you get one of two or three species, but they're very synonymous in kind of how they affect your um, your plants. So mm. the corn earworm, Helicoverpazia, mm. it's in the name. It goes after corn. You know what we grow a lot of? It's corn. corn. Um, yeah, it's maize. Uh, but then they they feed on all. They feed on tomatoes. They feed on tobacco. They feed on. But they love that corn. <laughs> they love corn. They love and also they also reproduce on a bunch of other plants we don't cultivate. They're just, oh, feral. Okay. they're just feral in the in the environment so like that's why they're such a huge problem and they cause some estimates some research has shown that uh budworms can be as much as like seven plus billion dollars in agricultural damage annually globally so they're, they were a huge problem way before cannabis became you know a little bit more mainstream lately in the last couple of decades so you know, they've already established, they've already become resistant to a lot of chemical um, insecticides um, and even some biological insecticides like the BT Whoa. I was talking about. They are resistant to what are called um, cry proteins that the that the BT produces that actually kills the, the larva. So, you know, like that could be a problem. And people think that maybe biocontrols can't be resisted, but that's actually not true. I was um, say technically nature can really just honestly, not to say if you if you put something around something long enough, generally nature will evolve some way, shape or form, whether it's their body metabolizing proteins differently or, you know, the way they go about, um, 
hell there's like fish that'll change their um their own sex just to like give birth and stuff like that if they're like yeah. and frogs and stuff so it's it's kind of weird what nature does my question i, I before i lose it because you've peaked the shit out of my curiosity with these moths though do you through your study and your own personal research do you think with having large cannabis farms do you do you think we're worsening the population of these moths like giving them places to breed and grounds to breed and and, and do that stuff um, they don't need, they don't need a lot of help with that. I mean, I, just, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I feel like uh, to be really honest and also to answer your previous question, not just the budworms, but also, um, cannabis aphid is a big one. That's oh, more and more I forgot of a problem about those. For a lot yeah. of people. Obviously hop latent vibroid. Mm, you know, we got that was a big one, one I talked about with Taylor actually. Yes. It's a big yeah. one that people are starting to really find a ton. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, so like those two, I feel like are becoming more and more an issue for growers outdoor and also indoor. Um, you know, those two at least, and um, you know, it's just it's becoming a huge problem. And I, part of it is not necessarily because people are growing more, because at least with cannabis aphids, that's a specialist that only goes after mm. cannabis. Mm-hmm. Um, and now why is that okay, can, we, can we talk about that real quick? I know I keep branching off, but why does no, okay. what what separates um, the cannabis aphids? from other types of aphids and why are cannabis aphids so detrimental in a cannabis grower's garden or garden compared to other aphids? If we could talk about that, maybe like compare root yeah. aphids to cannabis aphids. Yeah, sure. So I've, I actually, and for those who are very curious, um, I have what are called my pest primer videos on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, for those who are Ooh. curious to learn more about I'll these be watching. Uh, cannabis <laughs> aphid, rice root aphid. Yeah. So the cannabis aphid that has not a lot of research with it because well it only goes on cannabis and mm-hmm. prohibition and all that so yeah. we, have, we haven't had a lot of research about them but they are their their species name is forodon cannabis mm. so they're part of the forodon genus and there's other forodon species out there like for example forodon humuli which is the hop the damson hop aphid so it feeds on almonds and prunus species and a few other species of plants. And then it also host switch to hops. <coughs> now, the question that I ask that I don't know the answer to and that somebody else might be able to research is, um, well, so pe- people might not know this, but cannabis and hops, used to, they, come, they, they come from the same ancestor. There was an ancestral plant and then hops and cannabis split like about yes. 20 maybe 30 million years ago depending on the molecular clock estimation that you're looking at so and that's why hop that, latent affects it right because they have that same genetic physiology. ancestry yeah exactly i mean presumably uh viroids can sometimes hop to other plants but yeah in this particular case yeah that's probably why um so similarly you know a lot of times aphids are specialists Mm-hmm. Um, so they only feed on one or a few related plants and some species will host switch between like a springtime plant and like an autumnal plant. Oh, so like, okay. And so very few of them do this, but the damson hop aphid does do this. So it's a close relative. I guess what I'm trying to get at is cannabis and hops are a close relative. The mm-hmm. cannabis aphid and the hop aphid are close relatives. But interestingly, mm-hmm. the damson hop aphid has this host switching behavior which is kind of rare for aphids um but the cannabis aphid doesn't have that as far as we can Mm. tell so why did it just specialize and just so did the damson hop aphid develop that behavior like after the the ancestral split Mm -hmm. did it did it not it's a very curious question to me cannabis aphid is a problem for cannabis because it specializes on it and it does what most aphids do, which is that when it feeds on the plant, it um, it uh, suppresses the local immune system mm-hmm. in the plant. So it it, it has uh, some saliva. It has um, the saliva has like proteins and things that suppress the immune response, so that the plant can't tell that it's being attacked. Or if it does, it has a whole other system of figuring that stuff out, and it's very complicated. But basically. Uh, aphids work out really well because they're they're specific to that plant that they're feeding on, so they have adaptations specific to those problems, those immune responses, and they also reproduce without needing a male. 
So the females mm-hmm. just reproduce with basically clonal offspring. Maybe you get a couple of mutations potentially, but they're essentially identical. Okay. So what happens is that they reproduce those small ones, they feed in the same area. So that, that uh, effect of suppression sort of magnifies as the colony gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they travel to other parts of the plant and they continue to do that. And so like, well, it won't kill your plant necessarily, mm. you know, it might have other effects on how the plant develops. It might have effects. It certainly will affect how the plant responds to other problems, other stressors, like the environmental <laughs> stressors and other uh, pests. Will it, will it affect like how it eats, like uptakes nutrients from the roots and such? I don't think as much, you know, maybe if it, 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 they're basically stealing resources through the sap. Mm. So okay. I don't think it really affects the nutrient uptake usually as much as it affects maybe, um, you know, where some of those, well, mostly what they feed on is the sugar that the, oh. the for the photosynthesis. So, okay. um, cause most of, most of the phloem and most plants is sucrose. And so mm-hmm. what, what insects usually want when they're feeding on plants, the that one of the main things they want is that <laughs> sucrose. Yeah. They feed on it. They break it down in their body and aphids are really good at, at just siphoning tons okay. of it per day. And they break it down. They turn it into a compound called trehalose, which is like insect blood sugar, essentially. Oh, okay. And then they, they use that to power their body for metabolism. And then they use it for the really high intensity flight. So mm. insects are famous because they're the first animals to have powered flight of their own power, not just like gliding on the air or anything like that. So that's a really intense process. takes a lot of energy. Plant sugars are the way they power that. Oh, what? That is so wild. Yeah, It's so cool when you like, you know, these little tiny insects, you don't really think much of it, but the whole process that goes into it, it's like a freaking superhero, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's so <laughs> interesting how it breaks down like that and like your powering flight and everything. Um, one of my biggest questions, I guess, that I want to, uh, branch into and it, it may, they may not even be, um, related, but I, I have always had an issue with understanding nematodes and why you would pair them when you have aphids and what exactly nematodes do, or if you do pair them or not. I'm not, like I said, I, I've, I've not really done a lot of outdoor farming. So my hands with, you know, pests and things like this are, aren't experienced, but I've heard nematodes a dozens of times and I promised my viewers I would ask this question. So nematodes, can you just explain what are they? Do they help aphids? Would they even help with the cannabis aphid problem? What would, and if they don't help, um, I guess what would help with the cannabis aphid problem, um, in your opinion? Oh yeah. Good question. So I have never had success with, uh, nematodes against, uh, and if I were to apply them, it'd be probably for root aphids rather than mm. the cannabis aphid. But yeah, I don't, they don't, as far as I can tell, they don't work. Um, okay. I hear that claim a lot though on the internet. And so I wonder <laughs> if people have applied them and maybe applied them with other things. And then those things were actually what affected them or mm. some other thing that wasn't tracked, some other variable, um, you know, negatively affected them. But as far as I can tell, nematodes aren't really effective against them. And that's primarily okay. because they're too small as a host. Okay. Um, uh, rather, you know, cause usually, so like the nematodes that people often buy, there's several species out there. The SF or the Steiner Nema Felchia mm-hmm. species is probably the most common that I encounter. There's a few others like heterohabditis and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't think they sell that one at my store. It's just a little blue one with the SV on it or SF, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how the nematodes work is that the nematode gets into the host, like fungus nets are what I use them for. And they're very effective mm. against okay. them in my experience. I love, that's like my favorite, that's my favorite biocontrol to use against uh, fungus nets. Um, I'm going to try but, you this know, now. There's, there's a technical, but there's a technical, um, you know, nature to it. You got to apply them the right way. You want to apply the, um, you can have to use an agitator in your water. Mm-hmm. Usually if you're watering them in, you want to make sure that like you mix them in well and that they, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause if you don't have an agitator, they're all going to flip, they're all going to sink to the bottom. So you're watering them in and you know, only the last few plants to get the water where there's a ton of nematodes. So you gotta, there's some, uh, there's some dynamic to it to consider, but they mm-hmm. work because they get into the host 
And actually, what a lot of people don't know is that the nematodes actually don't kill the host. They have mm. a bacteria in their body that they release. And that bacteria does a lot of cool things for them. They, pr- they often produce toxins that kill the host. And so the mm. nematodes can reproduce in there. Um, the nematodes or the bacteria might produce compounds that are actually um, kind of anti-nematodal, which sounds like it doesn't make sense, but it does because they don't want other nematodes to come in oh. and get in there when they were, you know, this is their host, you know, they don't want to reproduce <laughs> in this host. Yeah. So you can get some like anti nematode factors that are sometimes produced. Not going to hurt your nematodes or anything. I want to okay. make that clear. Like, but um, but the bacteria kill the host. They reproduce in the host, and then more what are called infective juveniles will then sort of like escape from the dying and decaying host, and then okay. they go in to find more hosts to parasitize, and that's kind of the oh. the cycle. So they don't actually do the killing. The bacteria inside them does. That's super cool. That's kind of like some like poison dart frog type stuff. You know what I'm saying? They like excrete yeah. some stuff and then kill things around it. That's that's pretty neat. I always love, you know, I, thank you for explain, explaining nematodes. Uh, I call them nematodes because I, you know, I always say weird things. I swear to God. Uh, but probably uh, the correct way to say it if you want to <laughs> pedantic okay so well tomato tomato <laughs> yeah. um, um, i'm really glad thank you for explaining that because i to be honest when someone hits me with root aphids i kind of give them nematodes as like one of the things because it's just what i hear so much i've yeah. never had someone tell me yo it doesn't work that's actually quite interesting i would love to see um kind of like a side-by-side like study you know of like some root aphids of like someone giving a plant just those um and then maybe like nematodes with something else and seeing like oh okay it wasn't just the nematodes it was it was it was the other thing that is what actually did it so um we're hitting that one yeah yeah you you would like to see that study i'm because sure I'm, 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 I'm talking mostly from experience but i don't want to be doing that i want yeah. i would like to see research i would like to see an empirical data set i just want to put that out there because sometimes we don't have the data and mm-hmm. you know i feel like that's a disservice no i agree with you and the data that's the fun that to me that's the fun thing about cannabis it's frustrating but it is fun it's fun that cannabis is still being discovered because there's so much crazy cool scientific stuff being studied True. and like relayed but then it's also frustrating because you're like Damn it, if this was legal 40 years ago, we'd already have this information. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's like that that double-edged sword. Um, now we are hands down one of the longest podcasts now. And I I'm absolutely I've loved every bit of it. You I've been in like a kid in a candy store with my questions, and I've really thoroughly learned quite a bit. Um, I want to leave you off with a fun question. So my fun question comes to you being just a, I guess you could be an animal lover, an insect lover, reptile lover. What is hands down your favorite insect, reptile, or uh, bug, or micro insect, microbial? What What's your favorite thing that you've ever researched? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You'd think I would have um, a quick answer for it. I have, um, I would say that like, there's this really cool wasp out there that has the moniker of the king of wasps. And I'm forgetting the, the scientific name off the top of my head, but um, it was found very recently. Uh, I want to say it was in Indonesia, but I could be totally wrong. It might be somewhere else, but basically um, they have this, uh, I think the like genus name is like mega Calissa or something rather, which is a reference to their massive, massive mandibles they're oh. huge. They've got this like jagged, almost like a stag beetle. If you've seen those stag beetles, or antlers have like those, um, you know, denticles, those teeth. It's got like this big jaw, and it looks very scary and intimidating. And um, <laughs> I thought that it looked really cool. It looked like something out of a sci-fi uh, show. So okay. those capture my interest. But I think my favorite. I I really like stag beetles for the same reason. Mm-hmm. They look really cool. They're yeah. big. Um, not a lot of insects get really big, so mm-hmm. you know that right there by themselves kind of makes them look impressive. And you've got breeders out there again, mm-hmm. a lot of people in Southeast Asia who um, breed them, make them larger and bigger and larger horns, and uh, then they fight them. And uh, <laughs> I think that's that's very interesting. 
So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. I and you're talking about the um I'm picturing the ones that have like the like the three or the the one like right on yes, it. Like, exactly. Yes. Okay, cool. I love those beetles. Those are so cool. I've seen some videos right. of like they'll walk up to another beetle and they'll just like fling it real quick and you're just like, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great. No, that I love that. Well, you know, the Beetles are some of the prettiest insects. I think uh, for those listening, if you've never actually looked up beetles and their morphs and like what their wings can color wise. Oh my God. Beetles are some of the prettiest insects out there. Um, I'm right there with you. I like the pretty bugs and I like the bugs that look cool and aggressive. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for the, I think it's called like the satanic leaf praying mantis or something like that. Oh, it's yeah. like this diabolical. I think the diabolical yes. mantis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's so look cool. really cool too. Mm-hmm. And they're little tiny things too. I, I never realized that they're like the tiniest little praying mantis, but they're so tiny. But um, Matthew, it's been an absolute pleasure. And the only last thing for you to do, aside from give your uh, credentials of where everyone can find you, is give everybody one p- piece of advice, whether it's life advice, IPM advice, growing advice, maybe smoking weed advice. Just give them a piece of advice. <laughs> Um, I would say that the best IPM advice that I can give people is that step zero is to learn what the pests are that you could potentially get. Learn about them. Take take a few hours or longer. Learn what they could be. Learn if they're in your area. And also learn, you know, really standard ways that people find them and deal with them. And that will go so much to like helping you be, have that preventive mindset. Obviously there are other things to do, like gather your equipment that you need to find them, a little magnifying glass, <laughs> um, you know, a lens, a loop and yeah. products and things like that. But just do the, do your due diligence to learn what those are, because you might think you won't get them, but if you do, you're going to be in a lot of trouble potentially and I feel like that's kind of unfortunate. There's so many like populations and, and, and cultivars that have been lost simply because people just, um, you know, they didn't, they weren't able to kill the pest population. And that's kind of unfortunate as a human, that's human culture. That's human culture. People have done all kinds of cool stuff and we'll never even experience it because of that. So that's my, that's my one piece of advice is, Do your due diligence, learn your pests, and then create a plan of attack. I love it. I love that piece of advice. And it really stems back to it. Really, you're, you're pushing the holy grail of advice that I think almost every, I'd have to say damn near every guest at some point interviewing them on this show have has said, which is basically do your research. You know, you, you need yeah. to know what you're working with, do your research. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. I think it's, I think more people need to do research on insects. I think a lot of people don't do research on re- research on insects is because a, they're creepy crawly and most people don't like them. Uh, yeah. you kind of, you kind of have to get over that like creepy crawly look, um, and like vibe and all that fun stuff. But Man, I, I gotta be honest, dude, you, you've you absolutely encapsulated me with uh, a lot of insect stuff. I'm, I'm got a lot to look down. I've actually taken some notes while we've been chatting and uh, I look forward to potentially, you know, hopefully having you on in the show in the future and answering some really amazing questions because I'm sure I bet money this is going to get Hey, can you ask him what this bug is? Ask him what this bug is. I'm going to get 10,000 of those. So I I would love to have you on in the future of just talk your ear off some more about some more uh, bugs and fun things. But for the time being, you did mention you had a YouTube channel. I'd love for you to go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you, Instagram, all that fun stuff. So you can let them all know now. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. And it's also very endearing that other people have said the same thing as me because i really think that that is pretty important so that's great to hear so if you're interested to learn more um i have a few different avenues for that uh obviously first and foremost this is my profession if you need help whether you're a home grower or you're a commercial grower of various ways i'm happy to help you out with your pest issues i i conduct training for personnel about exactly what we talked about here on the podcast and more um, also I'm available for teleconsulting and also on-site evaluations and we can get into that if you need that help. You can also find me on YouTube where I post 
educational information about pests in general, some stuff that doesn't do with cannabis, but a lot of it has been focused on cannabis uh, adjacent pests. Uh, my pest primer series in particular, you can find that on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, Z-E-N-T-H-A-N-O-L. And then you can also join me on Patreon and you can get access to my Discord server for as little as $1 a month. If you go higher, there are other benefits like you can dictate to me a video that you want me to cover on a, on a topic. So if you're interested in that, you can check me out there. Um, we have over 110 people at this point who are also into IPM and can also help you with questions if you want to post pictures or ask questions like that because social media like Instagram and Twitter, which you can find me at SyncAngel, S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L, it's sort of difficult to do a lot of those diagnoses and it's not the best way to communicate. So the server, $1 a month, a lot simpler for me a lot simpler for you. And um, I hope that I can look forward to our mutual success. That's awesome, man. I'm definitely going to check out your discord and I'll be uh, posting it in our discord and a bunch of my communities. That's a uh, really great something. I, I keep pushing more people too. And for those like, Oh, I got to pay a dollar. Like what do you, what do you think is times free? What do you think? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> you think it's time. He's helping you for a dollar. That's like dollar. less than please. You have a dollar. Don't even give me that. Um, <laughs> so month. I know, right? That's like that's like <laughs> nothing, bro. Uh, so no, I love that. And uh, Discord is such a great place for those who have never been on Discord. If you don't know anything about Discord, because we do have a lot of uh, older growers on, um, that listen to the podcast, it's very, very simple to set up. You can get it on your phone, on your desktop. It's extremely simple. It's a really, really great place that a lot of growers and communities are going to because guess what? They don't censor. It's so nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll definitely be pushing that. I'm I'm urging all of my listeners, go, please go give him some love and support. Um, even if even if there's like 10 to 20 of you guys that go jump on the Patreon bandwagon, that's gonna help this gentleman out doing this thing that he loves letting matthew just rip out the freaking education to ipm to the rest of us because i know you all need it i needed it because i didn't know anything about ipm before this started i knew just the bare minimum to get me uh into topics and conversations with people but no i really appreciate it so everyone smash that like button for matthew gates and you for, hold up, before we get off, go check out his article in Skunk Magazine. That is so freaking cool. Definitely go check that out. Uh, I mean, that is absolutely rad that you got your article in Skunk Magazine, man. That is, whoo, look at that. He's for, for those listening and not on YouTube, he's showing us on YouTube his Skunk Magazine, okay? He's showing us. So definitely smash that like button. Go check out what Matthew Gates is doing. Go learn from him. He's a very down-to-earth gentleman, and he's a new face over at Homegrown Cannabis Co. that you're going to see a lot more on video, hanging out with Parker and everyone else in the garden, and we'll have him back on the show as well. So drop your comments down below. Without further ado, check out homegrowncannabisco.com if you want your top-notch cannabis seeds to get started on your journey. And remember, take his advice, research your pests before your journey, and then you'll be successful. Much love, happy growing, and peace, everyone. Okay.